Hi, good day. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hope is it sound-wise okay? All right, thanks. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how we sort of progressed from where we started off three years ago when, uh, when it was more apparent that we needed to shift gears in terms of our digital presence. Um, or phrasing it maybe a bit more business-like, how we sort of increase the agility and we're able to uh, increase the innovation at the same time by uh, uh, dismantling uh, the, the old monolith that's been driving sort of the digital experience for, for us up until then. Uh, so, uh, but before uh, we get into that, just a quick word about what Lindex is. Lindex is a fast fashion retail chain. We are, uh, where the focus is on women's uh, fashion. Uh, so the sort of the vision for us is to empower and inspire women everywhere. Uh, sustainability is a big focus for us. We're uh, uh, originally a block, brick and mortar chain. We uh, started off in the 1950s uh, back in Sweden. Uh, we have roughly now 470 stores spread out uh, through Scandinavia, but also in the Baltics and the Central European uh, area and um, the Middle East. And uh, two stores in the UK. So more of a northern Central European chain than anything else. Is it sound causing some troubles there? Maybe I'll stand here. We've, um, we have a heritage in, uh, as a brick and mortar chain, as I said, but we've also been running e-commerce for now well over uh, 10 years, with, um, where we sell throughout the EU markets. And um, with, with all the uh, changes that's been happening now in the, in, the, in the later years within the retail area, we've, uh, we've um, come to the conclusion to, to meet the demands of the customer and meets all the uh, competition set up by the retail pure players. We needed to shift gears and, uh, and, and, and it put pressure on us to sort of um, height, heighten and uh, actually expand our digital presence and, um, and do more. Uh, uh, meeting our customers, really. So, so what are we going to be covering here today? Is more, not so much about the architecture as such that we set up, but more of the thinking and sort of the pressures and some of the business outcomes that, that we've seen uh, that we've gotten out of this. And um, we've going to talk about how we've gone from one team developing customer experience, a digital customer experience, to multiple, how we've... Um, been able to start composing applications for very specific user groups rather than having a one for all. And then uh, along the same lines, being able to do some experiments on what really works for our customers and what delivers value for, for the customer and, and the company. On the technical side, we're um, going to talk a little about how we've hidden our old monolith behind a layer of APIs and talk a little bit about how well, API is a technique, but you still need to do proper design, obviously. And um, some of the value regarding standardization and, and how that removes sort of infrastructure code from the, the teams uh, doing um, customer experience development. So let's get started with that and start maybe 10, 15 years ago. And when we did start out with uh, our uh, Ex, um, adventures in, in uh, digital commerce. Remember, we were a brick and mortar store chain. Uh, it wasn't quite clear initially um, if e commerce gonna, was going to be a success and how that's going to be working for us. So it was started off as a very entrepreneurial uh, project where the, the, a team was asked to you know, see if this worked for our customers and if it was, was going to 
take off. So it, they started off with, you know, they had to carry their own costs, make their own money. Uh, so naturally, sort of, they, they started off with a fairly standardized uh, monolithic system that were prevalent at the time. And we've sort of iterated with that for well over 10 years now. And it kind of looks, you know, a bit funky. It's not very structured. Uh, it's worked well for us. Uh, it really has. Uh, we've, we've had quite a bit of omni-channel focus from the beginning, trying to tie in the stores into the process. Uh, along, this, along that, we've developed some very specific store solutions on top of the e-commerce platform, as well as uh, the sort of the customer-facing web solutions. And um, as I said, it's been serving us well. But it's one team that has done all the development, all the maintenance for us over the years. And um, the big picture has gradually been uh, lost along the lines. It's the full big picture is not really known by anyone anymore, I would imagine, because just because of the rotation of the team. Uh, there's gonna, there has been bespoke integrations and, and very bespoke security models introduced over the years. So, there's a lot of technical debt here, and we haven't you know, done a great job of paying it down uh, or removing it. And some of it might not even be known. So that was the story like three years ago. And um, we, we obviously knew that we had to do something. That were, there were talks about what we should do, and should we buy a new system? Should we do something else? And, uh, but eventually, well, we actually had, we really had to make an app because, well, everybody was doing apps, right? But uh, we, we really had to make an app for our most loyal customers. Um, so that was really the change agent where, where a lot of things started to happen and things definitely needed to be kicked off. The, the ambition of the app ob obviously was that, that it should be still be omnichannel, aware, uh, it should be seamless customer experience, meaning that you should have the same experience, prices, promotions, uh, product information. The cart should be shared between the, the app and the web and the stores. Uh, so obviously, it needed to be connected to this thing that we had from the beginning, right? Uh, and then at the same time, we knew that we were eventually going to be rebuilding the, the web experience based on a new CMS. We knew that we were going to be replacing at least the payment options for, for the commerce backend pieces and probably also the, the entire uh, commerce um, package. There were talks about how we should do promotion management across digital and, and, and the regular stores. So they, we knew there was a lot of things happening, so we didn't want to continue uh, integrating in this bespoke way with the monolith and in another way with some other uh, systems, loyalty system primarily, that was, that was needed for the app functionality. Um, and we also knew that we definitely needed a different team to do the app. We couldn't just add another thing on top of the existing digital experience development team. That would just make the team too big. And we, they weren't really skilled for it anyway. So things needed to be done. So this is as much architecture as it's going to be, I think. Uh, the, there was one simple concept that we thought of. Well, we had to modularize, as was mentioned before, maybe uh, cell grouping uh, as, as Maybe if we, uh, if we try to link it to something else that we've heard today. So we thought that we were going to be having a number of different customer experience focused uh, solutions at the top. So we had the customer app. We had the, something that we call my store apps, which is sort of more in-store in productivity tooling uh, used by internal people, but still on behalf of the customer. We also have a new web experience. Uh, we definitely going to have other web solutions as well. Um, but they're all going to be relying on sort of a bunch of, of the different uh, groupings of services or 
uh, responsibility domains or whatever you want to call it. So we're definitely going to have to be using the commerce services in the various experiences. We're definitely going to have to have content in them. We're definitely going to have uh, customer information in them. And, and they, all of this needs to be playing with the ERP level. So the, the idea was that, well, everything that the customer experience solutions are going to be needing needs to be exposed through the API level. Uh, and um, when, uh, when, we, when we have had our first iteration of the needed APIs, um, both on the sort of old monolith system, where we break it up in, in several domains, of the, and then some of the other internal systems that we're also going to be exposing, like the cust loyalty customer systems, the customer system itself. Uh, once we've had that first iteration set, we could, we could um, uh, change the back ends incrementally. That, that was the simple plan through the um, methods of API versioning. And um, obviously, we need an API manager for that. And we did a very, very short um, evaluation at the time of the in the market. This was like I don't know, three years ago, maybe. Uh, so we we um, surveyed the market for for products that we thought we could afford. Should we buy them, uh, or um, at least we're following some sort of uh, industry standard. There were a couple of options at the time. Swagger seemed to be more prevalent. The open API specification seemed to be more prevalent than, than some of the other options. And there were a couple of open source options that we, uh, that we, that we uh, looked into. And, but also key, one of the key things that, that we uh, were looking for was that whatever security uh, solution that was coming with the API manager uh, the key manager in the uh, WSA2 uh, case, that it could hook up to our existing customer repository. So we didn't have to reinvent how uh, customer accounts were created at the time. And uh, well, we're happy to say that we, we, we choose WSA2 API manager at the time. I think we started off with a 1.9 release. So I guess maybe two and a half, three years ago. Um, some, most of the other ones that, that we looked into have either been abandoned <laughs> or bought up by someone else. So it feels good that we that we that we where we are at 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 this point. Um, the um, just a quick update here as well is that we actually uh, during an upgrade we we added uh, identity server to the mix just because we wanted to be prepared for um, doing federated authentication when the client applications need that functionality. Uh, we've also decided, uh, again, very, a very simple choice, uh, not many thoughts about that, to hook up the same uh, API manager instance to both sort of internal uh, employee uh, and customers. So you could authenticate uh, as an employee, or you can authenticate as a customer, which has been a success in terms of getting the internal uh, channel applications to, uh, being rolled out. And um, yep, let's get the next one. So what did we do with the app that was so crucial to get out? Uh, we had, obviously, we, we got an app team uh, going to start developing the app itself. And at the same time, we, 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 um, we instructed the, the back-end teams that, that were providing both um, maintenance and development on the, on the old monolithic e-commerce system to not, uh, well, we, we asked them to refactor their code, basically. To, to, to expose functionality like the cart, like the shop, uh, wish list, like the, the order, uh, like the, uh, the pricing and the promotion things into uh, proper um, uh, REST, uh, JSON, uh, 
uh, resources. What, what, and what really happened was uh, just because of the situation that I was talking about before and the heritage of the web solution was that it, they didn't really refactor. They had to redevelop the thing because of all the heritage and the, and, uh, and the, yeah, the, the, the quality of that solution. So that part had to be redeveloped as proper resources, which took quite some time. And, and some of the other things uh, that, that was required for, for, for the app to sort of give the seamless uh, customer experience was on the loyalty and the customer side, where the team was much more uh, mature and had much more um, good engineering practices where, with a lot of automation, a lot of um, unit tests in place, build pipelines and general automation, uh, that, that, that they had a much smoother story going forward. Maybe not so, so much a surprise, but uh, definitely noteworthy um, for us. And um, we, we did manage to get the, um, get the app out. Um, not on time exactly, but it was, it was there. It was primarily the sort of the backend resources and the app development itself that was, that was, uh, that was causing some of the delays. It, not so much, definitely not the middleware at all. Uh, that it's the middleware has been really rock solid from, from the get-go, really. And as I mentioned, we, we also knew that we were going to do this my store internal productivity tooling for the in pers personnel in the store. And we were also going to be doing a new web experience. So while we were finishing up the, um, the app development uh, parts, well, at least the first iteration, it's continuously ongoing, obviously. We're never quite finished with the app. It's always development on it. There, um, the, we, we gathered sort of two new more teams to do these other development activities. And funnily enough, or luckily enough, and, or interestingly enough, whatever you want to, however you want to view at it, we, we've been able to reuse many of the APIs and most of the resources, obviously with a slightly different scope. Uh, we've, been able, we've had to add more, just because the in-store perspective gives uh, a um, slightly different uh, requirement spec for, for what they need to be doing. And the web has uh, you know, some other characteristics that, and, and the GUI is slightly different. So we've been able, we've had to add uh, some additional resources in this. But we've also been able to reuse quite a lot of these uh, resources that, that were, um, that were originally um, developed for the, for the um, customer app. So um, already here now we see that we've, that we've been able to set up multiple teams, right? Doing parallel development, releasing at their own pace, at their own frequencies. Um, so we've already sort of ticked off one of the goals that we set out with. And just one thing that I want to mention is, and it goes back to you, uh, what you just said here before in the session before about failing fast is that when it, whenever you, if, if, if you do identify that there is a need for different resources uh, for a specific client, rather than having the backend team develop something and shipping it off to the, 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 the client team, if possible, um, we, we try to uh, make that a joint activity so they jointly develop the thing. Otherwise, you, uh, or at least in our experience, is that with um, uh, the first iteration, the first version of the resource is never quite right. So you, and then you get into that feedback loop, which brings the whole thing to uh, a short or a longer delay, depending on how much you fail, right? So if you can do that, the resource development jointly between the using client team and, and the backend team, that's, that's, that's uh, great. Uh, but OK, but where, where is the innovation? May somebody might ask. You've just been talking about how you're going to do, have you, have you done your big program 
redevelopment or replatforming uh, work. Well, at the same time as all this has been going on, we've been able to run some other parallel development with other teams uh, where they've uh, made use of things that was already available. And um, I'm not going to be going through all these points here, but we have been able to offer our franchisees partners um, access to product information in a way that we uh, probably wouldn't have done otherwise had we not had these product resources that we took that we developed for the, for the app and the web, um, it would have been a more a bigger investment and maybe not have been done. We have been able to let uh, external uh, agencies develop standalone campaign pages with interactive commerce functionality being able to add products directly from standalone web pages developed by some completely random firm com uh, outside the normal web development team, um, point of sales modification and, and fiscal reporting in the stores might not be so customer experience centric, perhaps, but nonetheless, they're really important for, uh, for, uh, for in-store experiences and, and obviously complying with the Czech law. But they were also easier because there were a lot of customer resources available. Uh, for those teams to do their thing. Um, we've, uh, we've made experiments with, uh, and this was actually the first thing that, that came al uh, live on the API manager when we started out, the sort of the customer information terminals in store. I'm, I'm sure you've seen them here as well uh, in your, or in your home countries where you're actually, you know, you can scan something or uh, at the registry and you can change your... Uh, customer information uh, at the point of sales desk. Um, we have them in some stores back home in Sweden. Um, they, um, they turn out to be uh, of no value at all, for, at least for our customers. They didn't use them. So when we had piloted uh, these things in, in a couple of stores, we decided, well, it's, it's, this is no use. We're not going to buy these things and roll them out to every store because nobody's using them. Uh, so we terminated that. And it was fairly quick to get going with that experiment because we had the customer resources available. The uh, My Store uh, program, which is again targeted towards the in-store personnel, has been expanded with some additional um, Specialized applications, the my stock, which has to do with you know what comes into the store, what goes out to the store, uh, e-commerce packages, normal replenishment packages. That was fairly easy to get going because the order information was already there. Uh, my customer app for when in-store personnel is acting on behalf of of a customer, it was also conceivable because many resources were already there. We were, uh, well, GDPR, you know everything about that. But uh, external customer community is another great example of what you could actually do if you have these uh, identity server in place. You could, rather than relying on someone else's, uh, you, I mean, you rely on federation for authentication of the customers on your systems, but you could also switch it around saying that customer service, uh, when you buy a SaaS solution from, from someone else, you could offer them to log in on your system, act as an IDP for them, which obviously makes our customers' lives easier because you don't have to create accounts on, on the SaaS solution. All right, so I think you've understood by now that we have been able to add multiple teams as part of this journey, uh, we now have um, five teams. If, if we count these sort of franchise uh, partners teams as well, uh, we have them running in parallel, doing customer experience development. And we, have a bunch, we obviously have teams on the back end side as well, providing resources for all these uh, 
channel uh, themes. Uh, one of the things that we are evaluating right now is, is how to optimize these even further, uh, maybe scrapping the notion of the front and the back end themes and more look at more of how you organize these in, in cells or grouping of cells if we do that cell analogy again more of uh, can we make the responsibility of, of a team both include the sort of the front end and the back end logic for the commerce team, for example. Uh, and, uh, and, so, and the same thing with the customer and the content engagement parts, maybe. Uh, you know, all in, all in theory of you know, having less dependencies would, would enable us to do uh, things at a faster pace. All right, five minutes more. So um, the, uh, the midterm results are in, maybe. Uh, midterm, we are never really going to be finished, as far as I know. But we're going to be continuing, uh, as long as we stay in business, at least. So we, we've been able to uh, scale up and have multiple development teams now doing customer experience solutions. Uh, we've, we had. Uh, experiments and we've introduced customer and commerce engagements in unplanned places, which we didn't really have on the roadmap up until we saw that it was really possible and, and it was a low entry to do it. We have carried out experiments just to see what works and what brings value. Uh, we've we actually seen um, that, that gradually replacing the monolith is, is doable given that we've sort of scoped the um, various domains that it covers. Uh, we, we are in the process of replacing most of the commerce pieces right now, but we have actually switched sort of a few minor things on the store, store information parts already. And um, thanks to WSU2 and the stability of the platform as well as the open source model, it was, it was really a breeze starting out. It was really risk-free for us, uh, at least from, from sort of an economic perspective to start out with this, um, to see that it worked. Uh, and it was really only when we started to have live customer traffic that we actually decided to, well, we we're going to buy support as well. Um, and we did. And if we were to do things over, I have a couple of more minutes, so I'm going to see if we can get through this list as well. If we were to do this over, I would um, make sure that we get API statistics of the usage of the APIs. We don't have it right now. It, it looked expensive at the time, but it's, it's worth not having it. And if, if you do um, decide to do this sort of conversion or refactoring, redevelopment of the um, of a sort of an old monolithic system, make sure that after sort of the first proof of concept that you allocate a big chunk of time um, to do more of the development rather than splitting it up in many, many small uh, pieces along a lot, several sprints because it, uh, it takes too much time and it will be the feedback loop is, is too great. And also do it jointly. And if necessary, use force for any teams uh, that, that doesn't have automatic testing in place and make sure that you have that for your APIs. Uh, it's, it's a nightmare <laughs> not having it. Uh, and along the same lines is that you know, learning on the job is great, but everybody in, sort of in a redevelopment effort can't be learning on the job. So like, bring some skills into the team that knows how to do that. And uh, last but not least is that whatever sort of API strategy implementation guidelines that you set in place, make sure that error handling both from the service implementation but also from the client perspectives are taken into account there. Uh, there are a lot of things that, that we've learned uh, along the lines that the client or the app, app teams want in terms of how res, uh, result codes are and HTTP status codes are. Uh, sent back that, that can affect how, how you go about and implement your details. And uh, with that, I have one minute left, I think. And um, I'm not going to go through the highlights again. And um, open up for questions. And uh, thank you.